Thank you. Well, good evening, Lake Havasu or Calvary. Good evening. How are y'all? Good. My wife is here tonight. Everybody wave your uh, My wife, wave your hand. Thank you. There's my wife back sitting over there. She's my better half. So in case you think that I am ugly, yes, that's correct. But my wife makes up for it. So I'm grateful for that. Well, tonight, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be, I'm not sure what the, uh, uh, the Bible in the chair is, the page number, but we're going to be in Psalm 40 uh, tonight, Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. And as uh, Pastor Chad shared, there's a lot of difficulties as he heard my story. I faced a lot of challenges in my life, and I can really relate to David. If you're familiar with David and David's story, uh, David experienced difficulty after difficulty in his life. He was overwhelmed with challenges, even though at a very young age, God had selected him to be king. Isn't that interesting? We would often think that if God would choose somebody to be king, then their life is about to get a lot easier. Yet when God chose David, his life began to get much, much harder. David killed, as a child, David killed Goliath. Yet his story did not end there, did it? It, that wasn't the victory. His life didn't end with this massive victory. As a child, David was chosen by God to be the king of Israel, but his story did not end with that amazing good news. After he was anointed as king, after David defeated Goliath, he continued to experience great difficulties in his life. If your story that God has been writing with your life has been difficult. If, if you've surrendered at some point and became a follower of Jesus, giving up your old life, and yet you continue to experience difficulties, know that you are not alone and that God has a purpose and a plan for you. So tonight, let's take a look. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. Let's read this passage together. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Now, in this passage of Scripture, in the Hebrew language, David really uses words that are describing a tumultuous onslaught. When he talks about how he was stuck in the mud and the mire, he is really describing mud, muck, rising up from the floor of the bed that he was standing on, and it's as though his feet were stuck in it, almost like quicksand. And if that wasn't enough, as that mud and mire rose up from the ground, there were roaring waters that were coming towards him. Now, metaphorically, this is David using the passage, these words to describe the troubles that he was experiencing. So he wasn't literally stuck in this valley, this pit of despair, but in his life, he was saying he was overwhelmed and he could do nothing about it. His feet were stuck down in the mud. They were stuck in the clay. They were stuck in the mire. The water was rising. It was roaring. It was loud. It was chaotic. And David was saying, I was stuck in life. I was overwhelmed. Frankly, I think we've all felt like that at times, haven't we? Have you ever felt like you were trapped in your own pit of despair? Have you ever felt like problems were coming at you so hard, so fast, so much, so heavy, so weighty that there was nothing you could do? You felt as though you were trapped, as though you were stuck. We can all relate to a story of despair. We've all been there. We've all experienced moments in which we felt overwhelmed. I know what it's like to be seemingly stuck with no way out. The first 18 years of my life, I lived stuck in fear because of what my dad did to me as a child. My dad was an alcoholic with a very bad temper. He would throw temper tantrums inside our mobile home that we lived in. 
And there were nights that I would wake up and the table would be broken, chairs would be broken, cabinets would be flipped over, knives would be thrown through the wall. He'd play country music all night long, loudly. He'd shoot his rifle right outside our bedroom or right outside our mobile home window. There were nights that I would hear my mom sobbing from behind the bedroom door again because my dad forced himself on her again. I'd see my dad grab my mom and swing her around by the hair of her head in the living room of our house always burdened also by a secret that I wasn't supposed to tell. Always burdened by the fact of what my dad did to me behind that bedroom door as well. Always ashamed and always afraid that if I were to tell anybody what had happened to me, they would laugh at me, they would make fun of me, period. And so I grew up with an incredible fear about what I experienced always frightened because my dad would tell me, don't tell your mother, don't tell anyone. I felt trapped. I felt stuck. Now, my pit of despair may not be the same as your pit of despair. Your pit of despair that you faced in life, maybe your pit of despair is a diagnosis. Maybe you received that news from the doctor that things weren't going as you've been praying for them to go. Maybe your pit of despair is another failing marriage. Maybe your pit of despair are decisions that your children are making. Maybe it's a financial pit of despair, but we've all can relate to a pit of despair. We've all been there. My pit of despair may not be the same as your pit of despair, but we all know what it's like to feel overwhelmed. We all know what it's like to be stuck, to be trapped, to feel hopeless. Maybe your fear is that you'll never be accepted. You'll never make a difference. You'll never leave this world without truly making an impact that nobody will ever even remember your name. You may feel tempted just to give up while you're stuck there. You may feel tempted just to stop, to quit, to stop even trying. I want to remind you as you're stuck in that mud and in that mire that whatever your story has been to this point, it is not yet finished. See, your story is not over. Your story is not yet finished. David's story was not finished when God anointed him as king of Israel. David's story was not finished when Saul was chasing him down with the spears. His story was not finished when when he was overwhelmed in that, that pit, that mud, that mire. His story was not finished when he felt trapped, when he felt stuck, when he felt like life was completely chaotic and he had no control over everything. It was a page in his life, but it wasn't even a chapter. Uh, I'll share a story with you. We have four daughters. Violet is my third daughter. Now, Violet, when she was born, uh, uh, as she grew up, she's had a hard time when she was younger uh, crawling. We had to take her to our pediatrician who told us that she had low muscle tone, that the reason why she wasn't uh, standing and walking at age one yet uh, was because her muscle tone was low. So so we had to take her and help her and work with her. And uh, they had a special therapist that would work with her. So it's a big deal for her to get out now at seven years old and play soccer. She can't keep up with the rest of the kids on the field. She still struggles with with a tolerance. She gets tired easily. Her muscles get weak easily, but she hangs with it. She's not the fastest. And this season, it seems that it's been a little more difficult. Her team had lost every game. One week, they played a team that completely crushed them by about 13 points, and then they got a rematch. One Friday night, she began crying, and she looked at her mama and myself and she said, I do not want to play soccer anymore. I am no good. And mama sat down with her for a minute and she talked with her and she prayed with her and she whispered some words of encouragement to her. I don't know what she said to her exactly, but it was helpful because later on after bedtime, Violet came back out of her bedroom with this picture that I wanna show you on the screen. Now, I don't know if you can tell, it's right behind me. I'm on the sideline over on one side and I'm telling her, go get that ball, Violet. And Violet is on her way to the goal. She's kicking the ball and she's sweating. And I want you to look at the words that she is saying. Now she didn't spell them correctly, but look at the words that she said, I'm winning. Now in that picture, Violet, that's right. Yeah, it's a class. 
Violet is the only one in that picture that is sweating. She knows it requires her more effort than anybody else on that team for her just to run up and down the field. So I told you that they had a rematch and they played the team that crushed her. Well, they, they tied that team. At the end of the game, it went into penalty kicks because they had tied. Violet was the first one on the field that was going to kick a penalty kick. Now, if you don't know what happens, it's the, uh, the team that scores more in penalty kicks wins the game. Violet stood up there and she lined that ball up and she took a few steps back. The first one, she kicked that ball and it rolled straight dead center of the goal and stopped about two feet short of the goal line. Now, and I'm sitting there remembering the picture from the night before. I'm like, I am winning. Come on, Violet. Well, the next, you know, it went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And finally it came back to Violet. She was another, she had to break the tie again. I ran out to the field. I put my arm around her and I said, Violet, we love you. You kick that ball as straight and hard as you can. Violet took a step back. She lined it up. She kicked that ball and it rolled and it rolled and it rolled and it just got into the soccer net. But she wasn't the last person that had to kick. The next person came up and she's a little rock star soccer player. She kicked that ball and it went way off to the side. Violet won the game, right? So here is Violet. All she wanted to do was win. Isn't that where we are in life? When we're overwhelmed, when we feel trapped, when we feel stuck, we just need a win sometimes. Can't we relate to that when we're stuck in that pit and that mud and that mire? And here's what I love about Violet. Violet experienced the joy of victory because she did not quit when she was in her pit of despair. She didn't quit. She didn't give up. She didn't stop even when she wanted to. Her story for the season had not yet been finished. Her story was not yet over. God said, Violet, you're going to win a game this season. And she did. If she had simply given up when she was living in defeat, as many of us have, can relate to, if she had simply stopped trying, if she had pulled herself out of the game as she has done before, she would not have experienced that victory. I think one of the most dangerous messages that we can preach, one of the most dangerous messages that we can share as followers of Jesus is that when we became a follower of Jesus, all of our problems went away. That as followers of Jesus, we never experience problems again. You know, that's why a lot of times people can't relate to followers of Jesus. They think, well, you, you don't have any problems. You don't know what life is like. You don't know how difficult it is for me. And they begin to abandon their attempt at becoming a follower of Jesus because it's not easy for them. Well, that's not the real world, is it? As followers of Jesus, we experience difficult times. As followers of Jesus, we experience tremendously hard times. Now, I want you to know that at the beginning of this psalm, in Psalm 40, 1 through 3, David was rescued from his pit of despair. And yet when we look back down, he's facing another pit of despair moment later on in the psalm. A follower of Jesus is going to experience and continue to experience difficulties in life. Psalm 40, 12 through 13, David said, Trouble surround me. He'd already been rescued. He'd already been lifted out of the pit, out of the mud, of the mire. He'd already been set on a rock. And yet he continues to say, Troubles surround me. Too many to count. My sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I have lost all courage. Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. David was rescued once. And then throughout his life, he needed God to continue to rescue him from his troubles. Now, my life has not been easy since I became a follower of Jesus. 
One on a Wednesday night, I, I heard a youth pastor talking about Jesus and I, I, I made a decision that night. I, I want to follow Jesus with the rest of my life. And I knelt down and I, and I asked Jesus to forgive me for my sins and I became a follower of him. But my life has not been easy since then. We faced difficulties in ministry. We faced years of infertility, miscarriages or miscarriage, difficulties in our finance, difficulties in cultivating joy in our lives. Following Jesus does not mean that we're void of any problems in life. But Christy and I continue to believe, as you continue to believe, that God is the hero in our story. And God is the hero in your story. I want you to see what, what happened to David in verse 2. David said, he lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground. He steadied me as I walked along. See, it wasn't David pulling himself by his own bootstraps out of the mud and the mire. David was saying, I needed God to lift me up. I needed God to pick me up and set me down and steady me as I walked along. It's a picture as though God has pulled him out of that muck and mire. He has placed him on solid ground and then he didn't leave him. He steadied him just as a parent steadies their child as they learn to walk again. God is the hero in our story. I realized that that night that I heard my youth pastor explain to me that sin was the villain that separated me from God. My youth pastor shared Romans 3.23. He said, for everyone has sinned and falls short of God's glorious standard. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. It was then that I understood I was separated from God. I was separated because of sin, because of the penalty for sin that existed. And that night, I experienced a life changing decision when I surrendered my life over to God. I asked Jesus to forgive me for my sins and I began to experience a personal relationship with him that is life changing. See, God rescued me from that past that I had as a child. He's brought me peace. It was years later, about five, six, seven years later, I was holding my father's hand as he died in a VA hospital crying as he died of cancer. See, God gave me the ability to forgive my dad. I began to grow in my personal, uh, personal quiet times, reading God's word, studying God's word, praying, asking God to continue to change me into the man he was calling me to be. And God gave me the ability and the power to forgive my dad for everything that he had done to me. It's because God changed my heart. See, he's the hero. I didn't change my heart. I didn't change my mind. I didn't just set my teeth like flint and say, oh God, I will become a better person. It was God who breathed new life into me. He is the hero in my story. Now I want you to look at the very end, Psalm 40, verse three. Eventually I began to share my story about what God had done in my life, about the pit of despair that he had rescued me from. Eventually, I began to talk to people about my childhood, about my past, about the hurt, about the, the pain that I experienced, the sadness, the sorrow, the shame, the guilt. And I began to talk to people about it and say, you know, I used to feel that way. I understand. And God understands. I learned that my personal story can write a joyous ending for others. And I want you to understand that tonight. You see, the difficulties that you faced in your life, the challenges that you faced in your life since you became a follower of Jesus or before that. See, there's this very simple reason that you've experienced what you've experienced. It's so that others will see, they will hear your story, and they will put their trust in God. See, I've been able to share my testimony countless times and I get to see people turn to the Lord and say, God, I, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. They turn to the Lord and they say, God, I, I, I want to start over. I want to new life. I want to experience forgiveness. But your story, God has given you, God has given you that story to share with others. Psalm 43 
Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. My hope is this tonight, that just as I have shared my story with you, as you go into your work life this week, into your uh, home life this week, into wherever it is that, that God takes you, that you will begin to share your story and begin to understand God has wired you exactly how you are and how you walk with him during difficulties is what will help other people find God and put their trust in God. Don't be ashamed of the story that God is writing with your life. Read it to others, tell it to others, and let them find God through you. Let's go to God in prayer.